a foggy landscape, an atmosphere suspending in the morning dew, and then a sunny day bursts in with all its glory. This is Beethoven Fourth Symphony coming right up on conductor. Hi, I'm Gianmaria Griglio, I'm a conductor and a composer, and welcome to this episode of Conducting Pills, a series where we take a repertoire piece or a part of it and we analyze it from a conductor's point of view. In this episode, we're going to go through the first movement of Beethoven's Fourth Symphony, its structure, its phrasing, and of course, we'll have some technical tips. As usual, you can jump through different sections of the video by clicking on the links present in the description below. Now, let's begin! 1806 the year that the Fourth Symphony was born was a particularly intense one for Beethoven. The rising popularity of his music put the composer in a state of feverish composing, the Appassionata Piano Sonata, the Fourth uh, Piano Concerto, the Violin Concerto, the Razumovsky Quartets. Beethoven finished his Fourth Symphony in the fall of 1806. And its premiere took place on March 7, 1807, conducted by Beethoven himself at the Lobkowitz Palace in Vienna. Now, compared to his Third Symphony, the Eroica, the Fourth Symphony goes back to a late 1800s form. It's much less emphatic and heroic in spirit, and its dimensions are much more contained. What it does keep is the melodic invention and the process of development of the various motives. Plus, naturally, one of Beethoven's most common fingerprints, the rhythm. This symphony was beloved by the Romantic composers. Mendelssohn programmed it for his opening concert with the Leipzig Hebendaus Orchestra in 1835. Schumann called it the slender Greek maiden between two Nordic giants in reference with the third and the fifth symphony. From a structural point of view, we are in a typical sonata form, an exposition with the contrasting themes, a development, a recapitulation, and everything is framed by a slow introduction and a coda. Beethoven IV is pervaded by a joie de vivre and by a plethora of dynamic and luminous themes. However, that's not immediately clear. The introductory adagio opens in a static and suspended atmosphere. This introduction begins on a double articulation. The woodwinds, plus the horn in a pedal, affirm the tonic, the B-flat, while the strings develop a creepy descending line on intervals of thirds, G-flat, E-flat, F, D-flat, E-flat, C, and finally D-flat, B-flat. It's all very unsettling. The symphony is in B-flat major, but here we're clearly in a minor key. On measure 5, the G-flat returns, moving towards the F, the dominant, with which the second part of this first section of the introduction opens. And this tentative line anticipates what will happen in the Allegro Vivace. The second entry of the introduction on the tonic comes with an imperative forte piano. And the section is repeated and moved up half a step. Beethoven increases the tensions with a succession of half steps, taking us into the D minor area. And then, the tentative eight notes we've been hearing since the beginning make the orchestra explode in a fortissimo leading us into the Allegro Vivace. Now, the exposition immediately presents a problem. The beginning of the first theme does not coincide with the main phrase marked by the change of tempo at measure 39. Beethoven takes a little more time to introduce us to it. He lingers in the material presented in the last two bars of the adagio and accelerates it. The quintuplets in the adagio are turned into four sixteen notes in the allegro, then into two, twice per bar, then into a triplet. <laughs> Until we finally land on the B-flat. 
here's a suggestion to break the pattern at the beginning of the Allegro Vivace. Pulse on the 16 with a circular motion. Increase the size of the gesture along with the crescendo. And once you initiate the B flat and initiate the forte dynamic, reduce the size of your gesture. And you'll get a crisp staccato in the piano dynamic. See how lively and sparkly this theme is. But wait, Beethoven immediately opposes to it a contrasting idea played by the oboe clarinet and bassoon. Only to go back to the full orchestra a few bars later. And notice how powerful it is now with the timpani and trumpets. And everyone is playing the same exact rhythm except for the violas. A short bridge takes us to a third repetition of the theme. But look at how the theme in this passage is hidden and transformed into an accompaniment in the bassoon. As I'm sure you've noticed by now, the contrast typical of Beethoven's writing are very much present here as well. From rhythm to dynamics, we go from one surprise to another. In this respect, it's very similar to his second symphony, which we talked about in another video. The music cascades in bar 93 into a tense passage in syncopation. Tension vanishes almost immediately in the following bars, introducing the second theme. And the second theme, joyful and charming, is introduced by the bassoon, then repeated by the oboe, and then once more by the flute. But wait, here's another surprise. The second theme is correctly in the dominant key. However, Beethoven changes that almost immediately, getting into the realm of the D minor. and then stomps his feet in a big crescendo of the orchestra back to the F major. And now that the second theme is dealt with, we would expect a coda to close the exposition, perhaps. Nope. We have a secondary second theme, or a third theme. And this one is a canon in piano between the clarinet and the bassoon. retaken in forte, those syncopations we heard earlier bridging into the second theme are now used to create the coda of the exposition. The development begins with a sort of preparation for the real development. The head of the first theme is used in different modulations, moving from F major to G minor to C major. Until we land on an A major and then an A major 7th harmony, and the atmosphere is suspended again. The development, in accordance with the development of the first Beethovenian symphonies, proceeds by models of modulating progressions. At bar 221, we have the first model with a new cantabile theme in D major, played by the first violins and the cellos, and repeated by the flute, clarinet and bassoon. Actually, this could also be considered as a variant of the counterpoint of the winds of the third entry of the main theme in the exposition. The idea bounces back and forth between sections several times, passing from D major to G minor to E flat major. And it is in this harmony that the second episode of the development is introduced. <laughs> we can clearly see the two elements of the head of the first theme, the triplets of sixteens in the first violins and the rhythmic element in the cellos and basses. And this second modulating progression moves down by half a step each time. The last part of the development, starting at bar 281, consists of a long crescendo moving towards the return of the main theme. The harmony is fundamentally hinged on the dominant seventh chord. It starts with the second part of the first theme. And 
and lands on a B-flat pedal in the timpani. On this pedal the crescendo is built on the 16th note element in both its regular and triplet configuration. Notice how this entire section is only played by the strings and the timpani. Nobody else comes in until the fortissimo at bar 333. The recapitulation is contracted. There is no passage in full between the first two expositions of the theme and the third. After the presentation of the theme we have a short transition. And after presenting the theme again, we have a syncopated conclusion leading into the second theme. Notice the pedal of horns, trumpets and timpani on the F anticipating the correct key of B flat for the second theme. After the second and third theme have made their appearances, we are carried all the way to the coda with no major changes compared to the exposition. The final coda merely reproposes the various elements of the movement starting with the syncopations. Moving on to the head of the first theme, and to its contrasting element, and finishing up with one last call to those triplets of 16 notes. It is not easy to follow in the footsteps of Beethoven, not even for Beethoven himself. And what could come after the Eroica after all? From the point of view of structure and dimension, it seems like Beethoven took a step back. He even reintroduced the slow introduction typical of the symphonies of the time that he had abandoned in his third symphony. But Beethoven is still Beethoven. And even though the fourth has a more traditional approach, by scratching the surface we can see all his disrupted power. The unsettling introduction that resists establishing a clear B-flat major. And the rhythmic element becoming predominant in all the aspects of this movement. Much like it is in the first movement of his fifth symphony. Thank you for watching, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button right below the video and ring the bell so you will get notified every time a new video comes out. And you can now also show your support on Patreon, just follow the link in the description. Let me know in the comments what you think about this piece and if you have any suggestion for future videos. And I will see you next week with another episode of Conducting Pills when we will dive into Mozart's Symphony K504, also known as the Prague Symphony. Till then, bye bye.